We're all looking for skincare products that are out of this world in terms of the results they deliver. But today we're going to hear about a new anti-aging ingredient created from an organism that spent over a year of testing in outer space. Now an extract of the organism named Bacillus lysate is being used in the pioneering Aonia skin serum made by Delavi Sciences which was co-founded by Harvard professor and internationally renowned longevity scientist Dr David Sinclair. If you're new to the channel I'm Claire Johnston, a journalist dedicated to exploring skincare and how to age well. So needless to say as soon as I heard about this new ingredient I ordered a bottle of the serum which I've been using for eight weeks now and I'll be sharing my thoughts on it with you next time because today we're going to hear from a co-founder of Delavi Sciences, Dr. Kyle Landry, who will share more about this fascinating ingredient, how it was discovered and what the studies show about its potential to protect and rejuvenate our skin. Dr. Landry, thank you so much for joining me on the channel to shed light on what is a very interesting ingredient. No, thank you so much for having me. Let's start with the basic. Can you talk us through the background of your research work with, with Dr. David Sinclair and how that led you to this skincare discovery? So I'm actually a food scientist by training. And during my PhD, I actually received a phone call and it was from David. Mm -hmm. And he goes, hi, Dr. Landry. I'm like, yep, Kyle, you know, what's going on? He's like, you know, you're the only person in the world doing some of this research. Would you like to come in my lab at Harvard Medical School and, you know, continue? And I was like, okay, like. I, That's a cool phone call. <laughs> I, had, I had no idea who this person was. You know, we we're in different disciplines. So I go to my advisor and my advisor is like, oh, Kyle, you know, what are you doing? And I was like, well, I just get this phone call from a professor at Harvard Medical School who offered me like a research position when I'm done. Uh, and I think I'm going to take it. And she goes, who's this guy's name? What, what What's this guy? So. We look it up and we're like, wow, this guy, you know, is a pretty big deal. And she's like, you sure this guy called you? <laughs> yeah, like, you know, I'm not I'm not exaggerating. So after I finished, I uh, shot over there and my whole background. So my whole area of research is on extremophiles. And this ties into uh, the space ingredient, what we do here at Daily B Sciences now. Just beaming myself in to explain that an extremophile is an organism that's capable of living and surviving in extreme conditions. And it doesn't get much more extreme than outer space. So I've been researching extremophiles since 2009. Mm -hmm. So I've been in this space for quite some time. And why extremophiles are so interesting is because they live in environments that are normally detrimental to life. Yet somehow their DNA is conserved, they can survive, they don't get mutations. And, you know, we were looking at these things to figure out how do these organisms survive and can we take those mechanisms and study them to learn about longevity, learn about our own DNA repair, DNA mutations, adaptations, way to manipulate our systems, which is what, you know, the longevity field in biohacking is all about. Mm. So I was in extremophiles, uh, David wanted to get into extremophiles, so we we joined together. Now, from there, um, Dave and I filed a patent, and we moved forward to create a company um, that was focused on government interactions. And this is now where NASA comes involved. So I was working with numerous government agencies, including the Space Agency. And when we started working with NASA, this was around 2016, um, we were tasked, you know, with trying to figure out how to remove bacterial biofilms from the International Space Station and bacterial traces or remnants of bacteria on the Mars rover. So this is what we, we got involved with NASA on, and that is what led to us, you know, finding these extremophiles that NASA had collected over the years. So that is my story going from, you know, food science to longevity genetic research to you know, quasi-government research to now to skincare, uh, which is, you know, I never thought I'd be here. You know, and you never know what direction life's gonna take you in. Um, I mean, you mentioned it all boiled down to the experience with extremophiles. And I mean, how does that, how did that work with NASA in terms of what they made available to you? I mean, how did you stumble across 
the particular extremophile that leapt out as most in, of, of most interest uh, for skincare purposes? Yeah, so if you look at the history of this organism, uh, this was isolated from a clean room where they assembled spacecraft. And somehow this organism was able to survive all of the decontamination protocols that NASA had in place. So NASA was using this organism as a model to understand how to effectively decontaminate spacecraft in spacecraft assembly facilities. Because can I, because the way I read it, and I wondered, is, is this right, that it emerged on Earth in this clean room, went up to space on some kind of spacecraft, and survived outside the spacecraft in space? Yeah, so... That's extreme. That, that's <laughs> very, very extreme. And NASA was basically figuring out what can we do with this organism? You know, let's look at it as a model organism for cleaning, but can it survive space? Because that's the ultimate question. There's only a few things that can survive space, tardigrades, radio durons, things that are really extreme. So they sent it up to the International Space Station and they put it outside of the space station in the Expos capsule. And this is attached to the Columbus lab. And they put it out there for 18 months. And when it brought it back down to Earth, the cells or spores were still viable. So somehow uh, the genetic material inside of those spores survived constant space radiation, which is detrimental to life in general. Mm. So NASA had this organism, and we were working, like I said, trying to figure out how to remove uh, bacterial contamination in the water systems in the space station, and also how to remove dead bug bodies on spacecraft exteriors like the Mars rover. Mm -hmm. So this organism was a model for us to work in this space. Um, NASA also happened to mention that it had you know, great UVC uh, absorbing properties that could survive under UVC radiation. So we thought, I wonder if this could be modified in a way to extend its UV protection range into the UV ranges that we care about here on Earth, which is UVA and UVB. And so we licensed the technology, the organism from NASA, exclusive use, um, and we worked on it for about a year and a half. And at the end of that year and a half R&D cycle, we were able to extend its absorption properties into the UVB and UVA range. You basically took a microorganism, a, a living microorganism, and you you did something to it. And this is what you know. What did you do basically to get it into a state that um, was was usable in that form? Yeah, so this is the trick with a lot of extremophiles um, and a lot of organisms in general. And this, you know, goes back to old school microbiology. There are ways that you can manipulate organisms. Um, something that everyone is familiar with is antibiotic resistance, yeah. right? Antibiotic resistance is the a bacterium being able to basically break down or outcompete the efficacy of an antibiotic. And it does that because it evolves mechanisms to counteract it. And how does it evolve mechanisms to counteract it? Uh, it does it from being exposed to it, and then it can adjust on the fly. And extremophiles have the same type of properties, um, like bacteria in general, where if you put it under certain environments, certain conditions, or you do certain things um, with the media source, food source, you can force it to go a certain way. And that's what we did in our lab. Is It's kind of a trade secret proprietary mm -hmm. thing. Sure. But we, we were able to get it to kind of change and migrate its uh, ability to absorb into wavelengths we cared about here on Earth. And we've done that with other organisms too. I mean, our whole research here at De La Vie is how can we leverage extremophiles for skin care? And yeah. bacillus lysate is just the first ingredient. We have a whole f a handful of other ingredients here that all come from extremophiles. That's exciting stuff. You've you've put it into a formula that's now available. I, I purchased some, and um, I'm I'm trying that out. What what you're saying is it has excellent sun protective properties. Now, is it like um, some other ingredients that haven't yet been through the kind of FDA treatment that you can't really describe it as a sunscreen? Is it something that you're hoping will will get to that point in future? I mean, how should we regard uh, this this formula? 
Yeah. So the bacillus lysate's in a funny spot. Mm. Um, it's not a UV filter, so it's not actually allowed to be used in a sunscreen by itself. Mm -hmm. Instead, it's sold as an SPF booster. And there's a reason for that. In the United States, uh, UV filters and sunscreens are recognized as drugs. So yes. to go through and be approved as a UV filter, it's millions and millions and millions of dollars Oof. to develop something that companies want to buy at cents per kilo, right? So you're, you have to put a lot of money to develop something that companies don't want to pay a lot for because sunscreens are generally not expensive. It's a general commodity. So you'll, the time to make your money back is, is very long. So it's not a, a good financial investment to say, I want to make this a UV filter right now in the current state. But as an SPF booster, it is currently put into various formulations to enhance the SPF properties of sunscreens and um, help reduce the reliance of questionable UV filters uh, with a lot of uh, environmental data and endocrine system data, health data, coming back on some of these approved filters in the US. You know, this helps kind of limit the amount needed by giving extra protection. But itself, by itself, it is not, it does not provide sun protection like a UV filter but it complements it. Um, and that's, that's our stance right now. It is being used in a bunch of other formulations by other companies and sunscreens, even hair care, even hair care. And that's something we didn't think about, but um, sun damage to dyed hair is a big deal. If you get your hair dyed, you do not want it to be bleached by the sun in two weeks. I can vouch for that. Yeah. So companies, we're working with companies now to incorporate this into hair care products for dyed for dyed hair to help minimize sun bleaching. And that's an avenue we never thought about in the beginning. Substances like this, is that, would that be the right word for something that has basically been e extracted um, from a microorganism? What would you call it? Substance well, we call it a lysate. A lysate, a lysate means, just go with yeah, the so the name bacillus lysate is literally taking the bacillus organism in something that is created from lysing it or disrupting the cells. Do you see it as something that might have potential down the line or um, other similar ingredients to potentially replace things like sunscreen at some point? Yeah, so this is a question that we get a lot. Mm -hmm. And in the United States, because it's the it's in the drug bin, um, I'll say not right now. This is not the yeah. current time place for yeah. that. Um, in the European markets, we have had companies use this incorporated into their sunscreens, and they've been able to reduce the amount of zinc or titanium enough where there's no white casting or thick pasty feel. Um, I The way the formulation is right now, it's not going to be used as a main sun protection ingredient. Mm -hmm. but we are currently doing R&D in our lab to figure out what is causing these properties or what's responsible for this. So then we can make a more concentrated version, hopefully to enhance the SPF boosting properties. Uh, That's interesting. In, the, in your own formulation that you're selling, um, your anti-aging product, um, is, is it the, the major active ingredient or um, do you have, are, are you sort of counting on other ingredients in there to give it its full anti-aging properties? So this is the interesting part. Mm -hmm. uh, so David and I work together to figure out what combination of actives would work synergistically with the bacillus lysate. Mm -hmm. So the bacillus lysate itself, the form that is in the age-defying serum has very unique longevity properties. And we've done a whole host of scientific and clinical testing to confirm all these claims. And if you go on our website, you know, we openly post our clinical trial data. We openly post, you know, our tissue culture studies, all of the stuff. So you can see what I'm re referring to. Mm -hmm. But we leverage the bacillus lysate for other things. So, for example, it is a very strong antioxidant. But it's a unique antioxidant because it quenches free radicals that are formed from UVA exposure. Now, UVA is what causes fine lines and wrinkles. Mm -hmm. It is the, the energy that penetrates your skin and cross-links and breaks down your hyaluronic acid, your collagen, your fibronectin, all the things that make your skin elastic and plump get broken down from UVA. 
UVB leads to skin cancer, just mm -hmm. to, to put that out there. So not only, you know, is it a strong antioxidant, but any radicals that form from UVA exposure in particular, bacillus lysate is able to quench. So you're minimizing that damage. The second thing it does is it turns on or enhances your cell's ability to make your own hyaluronic acid. Now, this is revolutionary. Most brands put hyaluronic acid in the formulation and hope that it penetrates. The dirty secret with hyaluronic acid is if it's too big, it doesn't penetrate. If it's too small, it doesn't bind enough water. So you're not going to have substantial plumping effects. Mm -hmm. Nothing is more efficacious than your own body's hyaluronic acid. And the bacillus lysate increases hyaluronic acid production in skin cells by over 200%. So you have the protective factor from the UVA radicals. You have the hyaluronic acid production, which increases plumpness in the matrix, minimizing fine lines and wrinkles. And then on top of that, you have SIRT2 inactivation, specifically SIRT1. And if you're in the longevity space, you know SIRT1 is very important for longevity. It's very important for maintaining epigenetic functions within mm -hmm. your cells and minimizing epigenetic drift. And can you um, remind, my audience have heard um, other contributors talking about sirtuins. Can you remind us what sirtuins are? Yeah, so sirtuins are basically a, a protein inside of your body that helps regulate what genes are turned on and turned off. And um, the theory of aging that David has put out now, mm -hmm. which I'm a strong believer in, is that over time, our genetic material or our ability to read our genetic material decreases as we age due to a whole host of things, whether it's diet, mutation, so on and so on. And that's because the proteins that are required to read the genes start malfunctioning. And mm -hmm. sirtuins are a way to help control that and make sure that the genetic material is being read properly so that your skin cell is a skin cell and it's not actually becoming, I don't know, a liver cell or something else mm -hmm. over time. Um, a lot of companies use things like resveratrol or claim to use resveratrol to activate sirtuins. Uh, there, you know, but the bacillus lysate itself turns on sirt uh, sirt one in particular. Um, so one of the things that came out of the clinical trial that we did mm -hmm. that we were not expecting was the age defying serum's impact on hyperpigmentation. So at the end of the trial, uh, all subjects with darker skin tones reached out and said, Hey, can we talk to you about something? And we thought it was something negative. We were like, oh, fine, okay, you could talk to us. They said, um, our hyperpigmentation is significantly reduced or gone. Um, and they were wondering if they could tell us about it because it was not listed as a benefit of the serum at all. It was not listed at all. And we were like, wow, this is crazy. Like we have, you know, 20, 30 people saying this. Uh, let's go back to the lab. So we went back to the lab to figure out what it was doing. And we realized that it was inhibiting a handful of enzymes that are overexpressed in uh, hyperpigmentation uh, cells. And we went from enzyme assays to tissue culture assays and showed that we were able to minimize melanin production by almost 50%. I believe it was like 46 or 48% in hyperpigmentation cells. And that, so to have the scientific data in Tubo line up with the tissue culture data, line up with the clinical trial data, you know, that's icing on the cake there. That was that was not expected at all. And do uh, you think the hyperpigmentation benefits would be seen across skin types then? Yeah, so that's another thing we did. We, we started doing um, all skin types. We do that anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, but we started looking at other attributes in that range. And we've had people comment from ultra light to ultra dark, how it's been changing um, sunspots and age spots. And if, if you think about it, if we're activating like DNA repair type enzymes, if we're changing hyaluronic acid production and we're preventing free radical damage or changing it, you know, it kind of makes sense that we're letting the cells heal and repair itself over time based on the mechanism I talked about for the lysate and the serum. So, it, that was that was unexpected, and that's something that we get a lot of testimonies about, and a lot of people tell us um, that it's really reduced age spots on their hands, on their face, um, and that's a great surprise. 
And when you combine that with the hyaluronic acid and the prevention of, you know, UVA free radicals, you have a combinatory effect that works with some of the other ingredients. So we have like niacin in there as well. We do have resveratrol in there. So if any does penetrate, it does help boost the sirtuin activation. Um, it's it's an, an amazing property. You know, the bacillus lysate form that's in the serum does things that we never expected. Mm. Remember, we came with this as an SPF booster. And then David and I were like, let's see what this organism can do because somehow it protects itself from radiation. Let's see what longevity attributes it has. And then this certain form came out with all these great properties that are in our serum and you can only get it there. And you know, on a very simple level, it's like some of the research around sunscreen in general, which has shown improvements in people's skin simply by using sunscreen. You know, the, the theory being that if you protect your skin well enough from the sun, you also give it a chance to recover. You give the skin cells a chance to of kind course. of- Get, yeah. get back to um, stopping battling the whole time and fighting what's happening. So, you know, there, there's there's probably um, several factors at play there. Um, how do you recommend that people use it as part of their skincare routine? I mean, does this displace like the retinoids and all that kind of thing? Or is this something that sort of fits in around your routine? So I'm a strong believer as of less is more. I have, you know, I've seen and talked to a lot of people and they tend to skew their way out of problems. They think they have to buy another product, to counteract something else. And then they end up going from a daily moisturizer and a face wash to having 12 products they're using every day. And it takes them 45 minutes morning and night to do their skin routine. I think people will probably think I've fixed this because this is my whole thing on this channel. And then every time I get a guest on that interests me recently, they've all said the same thing. And I think, gosh, you know what? We must just be drawing each other or somewhere. <laughs> so we formulated this product, uh, the Age Defying Serum, to basically be the one use serum. It has vitamin C in there. It has hyaluronic acid in there has resveratrol. Now you may say, well, why are you putting it in there? I'll tell you because consumer acceptance of a product that has some crazy space ingredient and nothing else <laughs> is a lot harder than having a product that has other ingredients in there that people are comfortable with. Mm -hmm. So they'll give it a chance, honestly, right? Like we did some focus groups and we were thinking, you know, we said, if you had a product that just had bacillus lysate as the active, or bacillus lysate with vitamin C, hyaluronic acid, nice, and things consumers know, which one would, would you be more willing to try? And almost all of them said the one with all the ingredients because they know those ingredients. They know they have benefits. So we'll try it. So we yes, were like, okay, let's try to make a, a single use serum using Dave and I's knowledge about longevity in the skin to, to try to make this be the one-time use. And I always say, Stop what you're using or gradually wind it down and just try a cleanser, the serum, and a daily moisturizer and see what happens. And your sunscreen on top. And the sunscreen, yeah. yeah, and sunscreen at the end. That's obvious protection. But for your for your longevity routine, just try cleansing, serum, and a moisturizer. Because you can always go back to using all those other products. And we've had people say, you know, you've saved me a lot of money and a lot of time because now I can use a product that has all these things so I feel comfortable with it. And it comes in a pre-prime um, dispenser so you know exactly how much to use, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Most cosmetic products come in a random pump or an eyedropper so you don't know if you're using too much or too little. We designed the bottle to give you the exact amount we use in the clinical trials. So it's just one pump and then several drops, all they come shooting out at once. Some people don't like that, but I'm like, got to be ready for it. You got to be ready and then rub it and apply it. You know, you don't have to apply it on your face like they do on all the, the social media posts. But you've created a gentler formula um, for sensitive skin. Now, I would say my skin is quite sensitive. And especially in the early days to when I first, I'm going to be honest, when I first tried the um, serum in the original formula, um, I thought, oh my goodness, I'm not going to be able to continue with this because I got some reddening. I got little red patches around my eyes. I kept going. It has settled. Um, yeah. 
But what's the, why have you created the, the gentle formula, presumably for skins like mine, but what was the thinking there? So you're 100% right. So there is a purge period with the product. Remember, your the bacillus lysate is changing the efficacy of your skin cells, creating more hyaluronic acid, doing a lot of things. So you may see some fluctuations, but it usually goes away after a week or so of use. Mm -hmm. um, but some people with severe sense of skin do not like alcohol, for example. Mm -hmm. So alcohol is one of the ingredients we removed um, to, in case some people had some dryness. We also remove some of the essential oils because some people, you know, may, may, may be sensitive to some essential oils. So those were remo removed and uh, we did clinical testing on people diagnosed with sensitive skin. So this right. was an intentional test um, on people with sensitive skin and it came back with no reactions with uh, 100 people, which was okay. a, it's a pretty big population to do this type of study on for the sensitive skin. Uh, so this, it, it has the same efficacy. It's very potent. It has bacillus lysate. Um, it's just not as powerful as a formula, I would yeah. say. But the clinical trial results came back, and it's phenomenal. You know, it, it's it's very similar um, to the original serum. And I would say give that a try if the original mm -hmm. serum is just a little too aggressive for you. Um, and you're recommending that people use it morning and night. Yeah, morning and night. And uh, the bottle with the pre-prime pump should give you exactly 30 days worth, maybe plus or minus, because some people like to put a little more to do their neck or things of that you know, nature yeah. or their elbows. Um, but the way it's designed is supposed to be for morning and night for 30 days. On price, um, with it being a sort of 30-day period, it's not the most expensive, but it's quite an expensive product. And people will ask me about this. I mean, I see this a lot with um, highly innovative products like this. And is it a reflection of the research that's gone into it that affects, that impacts the price at the end of the day? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of R&D that went into this, right? Mm. This is not something, you know, we were not... Uh, I'll just tell you honestly, De La mm -hmm. Sciences was born out of another company because it did not make sense to have a quasi-government company selling skincare. Mm -hmm. So we decided to pivot out and give skincare a try. Um, and the price is something we're working on. I mean, the production of the bacillus lysate, that's all proprietary. That's done in France. We also have a site here in the U.S. Uh, but it's the innovation. The, the studies, the backgrounds, all of that stuff that goes in there. We are a science forward company. Mm -hmm. All the stuff is scientifically based. You can find our patents. You can find our publications. We are not just taking a white labeled formula and putting a celebrity face on it. So it's a completely different type of process. Yeah. You know, we're one of the only few cosmetic companies with patented ingredients. Mm -hmm. There are very few that have any. Okay. Thank you for clearing that up. Um, and last question, um, I've been exploring a lot on the channel recently, the skin's microbiome, which is we're just literally beginning to scratch the surface of. Um, that is a huge and fascinating area. But do you know um, how and if uh, bacillus lysate affects the skin microbiome? Yeah, so this is a great question. So being a food scientist, I've studied the microbiome for a long time, both in humans and also on produce like bean sprouts. I have a few papers on that. And the microbiome influences a lot more than you would ever imagine. Mm. So one of the first things we did was to see if bacillus lysate has an impact in the microbiome. So we sent it out for certification. There's this great company in Germany called My Microbiome. So we sent out the bacillus lysate raw ingredient for uh, face microbiome and scalp microbiome uh, studies to see if it had an impact. And it came back as being friendly, having no negative effect. And it is a, um, a prebiotic. So it's actually something that the skin microbiome can use to help grow uh, the beneficial bacteria. It's not a probiotic because there's no living organisms. And sometimes people think it's a living organism. No, this is a lysate. It's an extract. Mm -hmm. So there's no bacteria in it at all. But the compounds in there are friendly to both the scalp and the skin microbiome. We also sent our serum, the age-defying serum, out um, to be uh, certified as well. And that also passed. 
as yeah. being friendly for your skin microbiome. And all of that stuff is publicly available on the My Microbiome website. And actually, yes, I had a look. That's a really actually, actually, I was not aware of that website and um, it's incredibly helpful. I may I may try and get somebody from there to talk to me one day. Cause... Yeah, and they, and they actually have all the protocol. So under the protocol tab, you can see all of the testing, all the bacteria they, they test products against. So you can see how the product um, has an impact positively or negatively. Yeah. And a lot of cosmetic products have a negative impact on the skin microbiome, which may lead to oils or acne or other problems that then you think you have to buy another product for, which then causes another issue. So then you buy another one. And that's why I was saying, you know, people tend to skew their way out of problems thinking they have to buy something else when in fact, maybe you should be cutting things out mm -hmm. and seeing how your skin adjusts. And it's not going to be overnight. You know, you have to be patient. You have to give it a week or so to see because your skin has to adjust and adapt to the changes yeah. that are occur. 100%. Um, that was really clear and really interesting. Thank you so much. And I would love to hear about your new innovations and developments there. So um, I'll, I'll be keeping in touch. Yeah, of course. Thank you so much for your time. No problem. Thank you. So what do you think about this new ingredient? Are you intrigued? I will link to the Delavi Sciences website below where you can find both the original Aeonia serum and the new gentle formula, as well as reading more research and information around the key ingredient, Bacillus lysate. And make sure to subscribe if you haven't already so you don't miss next week's video where I'll be sharing my thoughts on the Aeonia serum, having used it now for eight weeks. For more from me around skincare and how to age well, check out some related videos in the description and you can read my latest articles on my website, honest.scott. But for now, thank you for joining me today and I'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.